bounties. Bounties, bounties, bounties. Ugh. Bounties, bounties, bounties. 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 Alright, well that was the video. Hope you guys enjoyed. Have a great day. I'm wearing a jacket. See ya. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yes, we got the new bounties for the Straw Hat Pirates. Actually, this is a rather monumental occasion because, um, this might very well be the last time we get the new bounties of the Straw Hats before, like, the end of the story. I would assume after the Straw Hats have reached Laugh Tale, Luffy finds the One Piece, becomes the, you know, King of the Pirates, you know, Kaizo Kuoni or a Wanar. I don't know if you've heard this, but word on the street is that Luffy wants to be the Pirate King. Uh, I imagine after that we might have, like, this big bombastic chapter where it's just like how with Roger, where, you know, exploits of him reaching the end of the Grand Line, the last mysterious island, those spread all over the world. World, um, back, you know, 24 years ago. I guess it was 25 years ago that he found Laugh Town. He was executed 24 years ago. Uh, so it's like, you know, Roger's the Pirate King. He found the island. Oh my God, this great treasure. And then he was executed, of course. So we'll probably have something like that with the Straw Hats where the news will sing all over the world. You know, this is Luffy, the new Pirate King with a bounty of, you know, it'll be higher than Roger's. So, you know, Roger's was 5,564,800,000. So Luffy's would probably be 5,600,000 million because 56 we'll just go with that i guess all of the straw hats will have higher bounties of course um will luffy disband the crew just as roger did with his crew who knows i guess that's up for debate but when it comes to like actually getting the bounties of the pirates of the you know of the straw hats and you know just as well as kid and the heart pirates as well um and having it actually matter in the context of the story moving forward this might be the last time we actually have that, right? I don't think their bounties are going to go up anymore before Luffy finds Laugh Tale, because we're now in the Laugh Tale saga. So that's how it goes. So before we start looking at each of the individual bounties and examining them at a little, little bit more greater detail than I did in the review, I just want to say... I really hope the fact that the Straw Hats are now an Emperor crew, that Luffy is now a Yonko, and their bounties reflect this, with Luffy's being 3 billion, and then the three strongest warriors on the crew, Zoro, Sanji, and Jinbei, or I guess I should say Zoro, Jinbei, and now Sanji. Sorry, Sanji. Um, you know, you don't have to be a monster trio anymore. You can be a monster quartet. It doesn't sound as cool. Well, at least I think it, it kind of sounds cool. Anything with a Q in it automatically sounds cooler. You know, that's why the Quincy's in Bleach are so cool. But anyway, yeah, Monster Quartet, whatever, they all have over a billion. And then, you know, even Nami, who had the lowest, you know, actual bounty on the Straw Hats, now has a bounty of 366 million, which is higher than Luffy's pre-time skip bounty after Annie's Lobby and everything like that. A really big deal. Then, of course, we have Chopper, which I still have some stuff to talk about Chopper, so we'll get to that. But the main point is... I want this to actually matter, you know, because before, whenever the Straw Hats bounties go up, they typically don't experience an immediate problem with that. You know, so like, yes, there are strong enemies the Straw Hats face, but that would have happened regardless, you know. So like after Eni's Lobby, Luffy's bounty is 300 million. All the Straw Hats have a bounty at that point. There actually was the Bounty Hunter arc right after that where they encountered Donna Sino, and that was actually a whole thing in the anime, so that was cool. But when it came to the manga, they ended up in Thriller Bark, and yeah, I mean, Moria might have been interested in taking them on because of their bounties, but they would have fought Moria anyway. You know what I mean? And typically when Whenever the Straw Hats do fight against the Marines, it's usually just like, oh no, there's some random Marine ships off the port bow, and it's like, who gives a shit? The Straw Hats are going to be able to take them on no problem. It's like, oh no, that guy's a, a Navy Lieutenant Commander, what are we going to do? You know, now that, the, now that the Straw Hats literally are a Yonko crew, okay... I want to see some heavy hitters coming after them. I, I want this to matter. I don't want this to just be like, the Straw Hats are sailing, and oh look, a marine ship is coming after us, and it's just some random guy that's like, I'm Captain Oblivious, and I will take you in, Straw Hat crew! And then they just fight against Captain Oblivious, and they kick the shit out of him, and then they just move on forward like it was any other Tuesday, you know what I mean? I want to see 
some vice admirals teaming up and going after the Straw Hats. I want to see them have some more run-ins with admirals in this regard, okay? Um, that would be really cool to see a fleet of ships, you know, headed up by, like, Aramaki left, but Aramaki's gonna be back, okay? You know, Aramaki's not just gonna be like, well, I pissed my pants because, uh, wait, what, what, what voice am I giving Aramaki? Oh, Boomhauer from King of the Hill. And I'll tell you what, man, yeah, that Shanks guy showed up, man. He used to conquer his hockey, man. I'm freaking him dang old, pissed my pants, man. Anyway, so, you know, you know like, Aramaki's it's not just going to be like, well, I'm done. I'm not going to go back. No, I think Aramaki is going to retreat for now and give it a couple of weeks or whatever. And then he's going to maybe get a bunch of battleships together and go after the Straw Hat crew full force, you know? And so the Straw Hats might have to deal with this guy directly, all right? Kizaru is still out there. He's so unpredictable. We have no idea what he's going to do. I don't see Fujitora doing that, but he might be involved in some way. But like I said, even if you don't want to get the admirals involved, you can just get a bunch of vice admirals together. Yeah, if you get one vice admiral up against the Straw Hats, I would say the Straw Hats would have good odds. But if you get a bunch of vice admirals together, because remember, that's like a very high position in the Marines that also has a lot of members because the admirals have to be only three strong, okay? And they're very, very strong, but there's only limited to three. So in terms of an actual rank that you can aspire towards in the Marines and like rise through the ranks, if there's no openings in the admiral slot, then you're just going to stay a vice admiral. And for that reason, there's quite a few of them. So I'm saying like if five, six, seven vice admirals team up and go after the Straw Hats, that's a concern. That shouldn't just be like, ah, they're just vice admirals. Straw Hats will deal with them before supper. It's just like, no, by the way, do you call it dinner or supper? I I've sometimes heard that there are even different times, like supper is earlier in the day and dinner is at, like late in the evening. When do you eat your dinner? Typically, I usually eat mine around 7.30, 8 o'clock. Anyway, so, um, yeah, you know, you don't want to be like that, though, okay? You get like five or six vice admirals together chasing after the Straw Hats. That might be a major premise coming up. It might be like the Straw Hats have to deal with a lot more marine presence and bounty hunters might be coming after them a lot more. And I know bounty hunters are kind of looked down upon on a lot because like we don't see them much in the story and you're like oh what are bounty hunters supposed to do to like a Yonko crew but I'm telling you what man there's probably a lot of bounty hunters out there that are in the new world that are dealing with really strong pirates they've just they just never have been the forefront of the story the cross skilled you know is now getting involved remember uh drug Peklo and like Giberson and everybody were working in the underground and stuff like that you know literally drug Peklo might be the strongest um mercenary in the entire One Piece world and I wouldn't say that guy's power is just trifling you know what I mean just because we haven't seen a lot of the the bounty hunter aspect of this it might work completely different in the new world right but you know rest and be assured there'd be no point of having the bounty system if there weren't strong people out there in the world that can bring them in you know because otherwise what's the point what's the point of giving Luffy a three billion berry bounty if the government knows there's no way there's bounty hunters or mercenaries in the world that could take on Luffy it's like it really doesn't make any any sense, you know? So that implies that, yeah, there are mercenaries and bounty hunters out there that could potentially deal with them, okay? I'm sure Kaido had to deal with it. I'm sure Big Mom had to deal with bounty hunters showing up at her doorstep. Some of them were probably weak, but some of them were probably stronger than you would give them credit for, okay? Anyway, just wanted to bring that up. I hope the fact that their bounties are now so high, and now they are a Yonko crew, honestly a Yonko fleet, if you want to, you know, throw the Straw Hat Grand Fleet in there, I just hope that there's some consequence to their level of infamy and their level of power and influence and their sheer amount of bounty power in the world right now, right? Like, they're actually having to be, uh, they have to deal with these, like, really strong bounty hunters and people coming for them, right? Um, bounty power. That kind of sounds like an advertisement for bounty paper towels. You know, it has ten times more bounty power. All right, speaking of 10 times more bounty power, let's talk about Chopper. You know, I saw a lot of people in the comments section that were like, hey man, if there's one saving grace with Chopper's bounty, you gotta say, it went up 10 times over. It's the largest bounty increase out of anybody. Luffy's bounty only doubled from 1.5 billion to 3 billion. Chopper's went up 10 times! 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1,000 berries! Incredible! Okay. So I went on at length in the review about Chopper's bounty and how it really doesn't make any damn sense to be a gag bounty at this point. You know what I mean? Like, does the world government not know that zone fruits exist? Do they not know that Chopper can turn into a giant monster and, like, wreck a bunch of, like, pirates' ships and stuff easily single-handedly, right? Do they not know that he body slammed Queen? They apparently had some idea that they were all there fighting against Kaido's crew. Apu was there taking pictures of all the highlights and everything, right? So.
Like, and also, Sentomaru, who worked for the world government, fought against the damn monster point. So it's like, why do they still not give Chopper the, the respect that he deserves? And so in the review, I mentioned a possibility like, do the Marines just not know that Minx exist? Or are they trying to downplay the existence of Minx for whatever reason? You know what I mean? Like, and you know what? There actually is some way to look at that. Like, you know, I even saw some comments like, well, maybe... The government doesn't want the people to know about Minx because then they'll know about Zoe, and Zoe has a lot of, you know, history and mystery re relating to the Void Century. So I, I saw some, you know, like, um, you know, line of reasoning with that. But then other people were like, Pedro had like a 300 million, you know, berry bounty. And I went back and checked, and he did. Pedro was a mink. He had a really commendable bounty, all right? Uh, I, I don't know if Zeppo, his second in command, Beppo's older brother, I don't know if Zeppo was confirmed to have a bounty, but he probably did. He was like the first mate with Pedro on the Nox expeditionary party, which would later become the Nox pirate crew, all right? So it can't be that, which makes that even more confusing for why they look at Pedro and they're like, Pedro, he's a. Uh, He's a mink, he's a jaguar, and he's dangerous, slapping over 300 million berry bounty on his head. But then they look over at the heart pirates at Beppo, who is clearly a mink, he's a polar bear, so you can't even say that, like, well, Chopper's a reindeer and Pedro's a jaguar, so obviously one is more dangerous than the other, although I really wouldn't want, I would not want to piss off a reindeer, you know, and a reindeer is pretty big, they come charging at you, that doesn't sound like a fun day, you know what I mean? Not as dangerous as a moose, but you still don't want to piss them off, you know what I mean? Santa could wreck your day. Okay, Santa slay. Yeah, there you are. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so that doesn't make any sense, though, because Beppo is a damn polar bear, which in our world is currently the largest bear species not to ever exist. There was the cave bear, but they're extinct, so nobody cares about the cave bear anymore. Giant polar bear wearing a jumpsuit that's using martial arts and everything like that, and the government looks at Beppo and is just like, yeah, polar bear mink working for Trafalgar Law. 500 berries. They're just, it's just a pet. You know, just like, and they do the same thing with choppers, so I'm like, you know what, honestly, there were people that were joking that were like, what about, like, they're like PETA, you know what I mean, like, to protect the animals and everything. What if there is a dude in the Marines that's like, I don't want to hurt the animals, <laughs> and just like, it's because of him that it's just like, the, the bounties for these animals go down. Pedro's bounty was given a while ago, so maybe this person joined the Marines and is just like, you know what? I don't want anybody to hurt Chopper. I don't want anybody to hurt Beppo. Let's just make their bounties really, really low. I feel like, okay, even if it is a gag, there has to be a reason for the gag. Like, we are going to find a reason there's somebody in the Marines, somebody in the world government that is actively lowering Chopper and Beppo's bounties for some reason or another, okay? And it could be a silly, goofy reason. I just want a reason, you know what I mean? Because it really makes zero sense, okay? Um, but yeah, that's Chopper, 1,000 berries. Uh, I thought it was like 10 bucks in American, but no, it's closer to like 7 bucks American. So $7 buying power, Chopper. You walk into a Dollar Tree. Well, actually, Dollar Tree increased their uh, price is to a buck 25 so not as much buying power as before but you could buy at least five things at a dollar tree okay so there you go chopper next up we have uh nami with a bounty of 366 million uh really i think the bounties for nami brooke frankie usopp they all make sense just like the flat increase of 300 million um how do you guys feel about brooke having the third lowest bounty of the straw hats or if you exclude chopper because of his gag bounty Brooke has the second lowest bounty out of the Straw Hats. So I'm looking at all the numbers here, and I'm really, like... I mean, maybe you can make a switch with Usopp just because Usopp is... Okay, Usopp versus Brook. And I know bounties are not purely based on battle power, okay? Usopp does have an ability that he's able to, like, sway people around him and stuff and strike terror into the hearts of men. He set himself up as a god on Earth. I mean, that's an ability. I'm just saying, like, Usopp versus Brook in, like, straight-up combat... I think I would probably... Well, how much prep time does Usopp get? That's the big question. I think Usopp might be able to take on any of the Straw Hats if enough prep time is given. I mean, look how far he got with the fight with Luffy. And that was pre-time skip. Yeah, Usopp with... Give Usopp a one-month prep time amount, and he could probably take on Gear 5 Luffy. That's probably fair. But no, Usopp versus Brook in sheer, in sheer battle power. I would probably... 
I would probably side with Brook, honestly. So maybe you can make an argument for that. Maybe it would go Chopper, Nami, and then Usopp as the lowest bounties. And then maybe Brook and then Frankie, or Frankie and then Brook. Um, I would put Frankie and Brook a lot more comparable there than Usopp. Nothing against Usopp. He has a lot of other uh, useful, you know, uh, uh, traits to him. But it's just battle power alone. He has a lot of that as well. It's just that I think there's a lot of Straw Hats that have more of it. You know, like Brook can literally harness the power of ice from the underworld. Frankie's all armored out with a bunch of different, like, missiles and everything. Uh, Usopp's got his pop greens, which are really handy, really cool. Um, but, you know, look what happened at the fight with Page One. The pop greens were really doing nothing, and uh, they, they were kind of running for their lives there. You know what I mean? Usopp never even actually got a, a, a victory, a major victory at Onigashima, other than just, like, the random waiters and the pleasures around him. I mean, yeah, Usopp can take on some random grunts, no problem, uh, but he didn't even get to fight and win against, uh, you know, Page One. So, you know what I mean? So maybe switch those out a little bit, but the fact that he's got Usopp that's also kind of going along with a running gag, so we kind of have to keep that up. Um, I'm going to actually move that over here so I don't have to keep looking back over here. Um, let's see. But yeah, so I guess it's okay. Uh, the Frankie thing I'm still confused by. I really don't understand why they picked the figurehead of the Sunny. Uh, maybe, like I said in the review, maybe they literally just thought that, like, okay, Frankie upgraded himself to the Iron Frankie, uh, the Iron Pirate Frankie Shogun, and so that they just assumed that was his new, um, you know, form, so that's why the picture was there from Fishman Island, and now because Frankie got stronger, um, I I'm trying to think of, like, any moment during Onigashima, like, it would be a different story if, like, let's say Frankie did merge with the Sunny during Onigashima, like, he was fighting against Sasaki, and Frankie leads him outside, and he jumps on the Sunny, and he uses the Gao Cannon combined with his own coup de burst or whatever, or coup de vent, and he attacks Sasaki, and that's how he defeated him originally. Let's say that's what happened. It didn't, but let's say that's how it happened. I can see the government thinking there, like, well, Frankie merged with the Sunny to defeat Sasaki, therefore it must be his true form. You know, Frankie has become the battleship, right? It also might be a nod to SBS 101, where uh, they did, uh, Oda showed what would happen if Frankie, you know, at age 40 and 60, or no, because Frankie's older, I think it was 50 and 70 for Frankie. Uh, he was a little bit older than the rest of the Straw Hats. Um, you know, at age 50, he's like a complete, like, death robot, like, destroy all humans, destroy all humans, and then at age 70, he's literally turned himself into a battleship, like the Frankie warship, okay? So maybe there's, there's a reference to that, that's what Oda's going for here. Um, and honestly, I was a little bit like, Frankie was, like, initially upset that, like, what the hell is with this Bot Wanted poster? I'm not the Sunny. What is this? But I'm thinking maybe, like, this actually might work out to our advantage because Frankie now, like, it might be harder for him to be recognized, so maybe Frankie can go about in his business more often because the bounty doesn't even, like, it's not even him. So there could be that. But also the fact that Frankie built the Thousand Sunny and it was his schematics and everything like that, I'm thinking that Frankie, like, eventually might be okay with it. Like, initially he was pissed off, but the fact that, like, this was my creation and it has a bounty of 394 million, I mean, I still think he's going to be mad no matter what, but that might be what he does to, like, justify it. Like, oh, okay, well... At least it might not be my picture on here, but it's the picture of my greatest creation ever. Something along those lines, that might be able to work. Okay. Uh, then we have Usopp with 500 million. I love the fact that Usopp is now caught up to Luffy's bounty post Dressrosa, which is not even a pre time skip bounty, it's a post time skip bounty. Um, Usopp is definitely getting up there in the world. I would like to see, because he was worried about bounty hunters coming to go after him, uh, you know. And I would like to see, because he mentioned, like, bounty hunters coming after him because of this high bounty, I would actually like to see that now. I would like to see Usopp take on some bounty hunters by himself to prove that he's worthy of that bounty. You know, like, a bunch of really strong, he's like, oh, you're God Usopp, we're gonna bring you in. And Usopp is maybe separated from the rest of the Straw Hats, so they can't help him. And so Usopp is just like, okay... I guess it's all on me then. And it might be a moment where Usopp actually makes another step on becoming, like, the, the brave warrior of the sea. Like, I think he's become a brave warrior of the sea already uh, to face his fears and manage to, you know, overcome them when he has to. Remember, being brave does not mean you you show no fear at any moment of your life. I would rather, you know, depict that as being, like, uh, like stupid. You know what I mean? If you're just so, just like, oh, I, I have no fear at anything. I just charge right in. That's, that's kind of what Luffy does sometimes. 
times, although even Luffy does show fear. When Luffy knows that the Straw Hats cannot defeat an enemy, he doesn't like, all right, everybody, well, to the death! You know, like, it's nothing like that. Look at it, what happened at Sabaody when Kuma was there and the Pacifistas were there and Kizaru was there. Luffy was like, you know, we can't win this one. We need to retreat. So being brave is not the same thing as just having no fear whatsoever. It's overcoming your fear when it's the most important. And I think Usopp does have that in spades. But it's like, when does Usopp himself consider himself, you know, a brave warrior of the sea? And so I think we're going to make a few more strides with that. And I think a good way to do it would be like Usopp is by himself and he gets jumped by a bunch of bounty hunters and he has to defeat them all on their on his own. And they're not like some random grunts. Like they can actually, maybe some of them have devil fruit abilities, some of them have hockey, and Usopp has to overcome that, okay? And uh, at the end of the day, Usopp might start to consider himself like maybe I am uh, God Usopp. Maybe I am worthy of this 500 million berry bounty. Something like that I would like to see from Usopp in the future. Uh, then we have Robin, uh, who has the fifth highest bounty in the Straw Hat crew, and it's 930 million. This was an increase from uh, 130, so the government is finally beginning to realize, or at least they've always known how dangerous she is, but now we're in the end game, sort of. We know that, like, okay, the ancient weapons, their locations are becoming more known to everybody, and the world government's worried about, like, this purge. Well, they might be, you know, activating a purge because they're worried about the, the state of the way the world's in and everything. So, Robin is becoming more and more integral to everybody here, and um, I think now they're kind of dropping the pretenses, and they're like, okay, Robin is is very, very dangerous. I believe the original reason Robin was issued the bounty, at least the, the reason that the government gave, was because uh, she sank a bunch of warships, right? Like, when she was a little kid on Ohara, I don't believe the official story was this child can read poneglyphs, this is very dangerous. Um, I believe the, the reason they gave was, oh, Robin was the devil child, she sank a bunch of battleships when she was only eight years old, and so that's the reason they gave her that bounty at that young age. Um, and so now, though, her bounty is skyrocketing, the government might not be trying to keep the facade up anymore, and just being like, it doesn't matter, uh, Robin is, you know, she can read poneglyphs, bring her in at all costs, okay? So, might be a situation of that there. Um, I was a little upset because I thought she had the highest, uh, bounty out of any female female character in the story, and I'm like, yeah, you go, Robin! And then it turns out Smoothie has a bounty that is only 2 million higher than hers. Smoothie has a bounty of 932 million, and I'm like, ah, damn it! Although, I would like to see a battle between Smoothie and Robin now, and Robin can transform into a giant woman as well. She can actually transform into a giant demon woman, and, uh, who's naked, and then fighting Smoothie, who can just make herself bigger using the juicing ability. I'm going off on a tangent. I don't know. I might make a separate video about that. Anyway, um, that would be cool to see, right? I mean, I'd pay money for that. I'd buy that for a dollar. Okay, anyway, uh, so that's Robin. I, I kind of wish she should have a bounty of over a billion, honestly. I think that would be more fitting to her, um, just in terms of, like, literally using her knowledge. She can awaken. Like, she could have, if she wanted to, could have awakened Pluton in the last arc, or at least could have found its location and learned about what it is. Um, I, I guess Robin and Law decided not to look for it further, and it makes sense because they didn't really want Pluton, and uh, Sukiyaki explained that, you know, activating Pluton would mean bringing bringing down the walls of Wano, and they didn't want to do that. But let's say for a moment, Law and Robin were, like, evil, okay? Or they were a lot more... They, they were very interested in awakening the ancient weapons, okay? If they had that kind of morality, they wouldn't give a shit about bringing down the walls of Wano. They wouldn't worry about destroying the land that Momonosuke lived in. If they really, really wanted to, Law and Robin working together, I think they could have easily found Pluton. They could have awakened it using Robin's uh, knowledge, and they might have, like, destroyed all of Wano, and now they have an access to a battleship. Also, Luffy has no interest in that, so of course Robin does not either, but just to say, this is how dangerous Robin is, I'd say a bounty of at least over a billion, or maybe just one billion even, or one billion thirty million, or something like that, you know, to go along with the thirty aspect, that would have, that would have fit as well. Eh, whatever. Alright, so next is Sanji. Now, there's actually some interesting stuff about Sanji before we even get to the number he's at right now, okay? So, I thought we didn't get to see their wanted posters, only maybe a few of them, because, you know, Oda just did the narrator thing with, like, you know, Brook now has a bounty of 383 million, the Soul King, right? We don't actually get to see Brook's updated wanted poster. We actually do get to see a few of them, they're just like off to the side and whatever, so a few people did point this out. Couple of things. Number one, 
Sanji's new wanted poster apparently just went back to saying Sanji, so they omitted the Vin smoke. Don't know what's up with that. Maybe Judge pulled some strings, or maybe he's back in the fold and, you know, has maybe he is on good terms with the world government now, but I don't think they would be. So whatever. But for whatever reason, they removed the Vin smoke from Sanji's name. And the other thing is, if you actually go and look back and look at the chapter, and you could see Sanji's poster, it's kind of tiny and off to the side, but you could see it there. It's back to his original poster picture. Now, like with the one that where he looks like Duval, okay? So, I'm not really sure if this is intentional or not, just because Sanji didn't bring it up in the last chapter, you know? So, this might be something that Oda might correct later in the Tonkoban. Like, he made a mistake. Like, Sanji's wanted poster shouldn't look like the old one. It should look like the newer one. Um, because I'm just saying that, like... If they took his wanted poster and it went back to being a drawing, that doesn't make any sense for the Marines because, like, yeah, I know we have an accurate picture of Vin Smoke Sanji right now, but, eh, let's go back to that drawing. It was a lot more fun. And I also think Sanji would have brought it up in the chapter, just like Frankie brought up, like, hey, my, my picture's gone. It's now the Sunny. Wouldn't have Sanji brought up, like, damn it, it's back to that stupid drawing, you know? Like, like he would have mentioned it. And he was upset, he was fuming in the last chapter, but he didn't bring up the picture at all. He brought up the fact that his bounty was now lower than Zoro's, that he was number four and Zoro was now number two. And the reason he was mad was because Zoro's bounty, I mean, he actually used to have a higher bounty than Zoro, and now he doesn't anymore, and so now he's like, pride cometh before the fall, he's now upset. You know, he's like, oh, I was on top, and now I'm number four, you know, something like that. So... You know, I think Sanji would have brought up the fact that his bounty, his wanted poster, his bounty was now back to being that stupid drawing, and he would have mentioned it to the crew, and it was only seen in one little shot near the end. So I'm like, eh, maybe, maybe that was a mistake on Oda's part. Uh, if not, then I guess we'll explore that, why they would go back to a drawing for some reason. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but yeah, so I guess they changed his name. But his name going back to just Sanji, I could see that happening, just because it's like, okay, you know, he is a Vince Smoke, but he's discarded that that title he doesn't want to be considered a Vin smoke anymore it's just easier just to call him sanji you know what i mean right so yeah that also might lead to the false belief that the straw hats are allied with the Vin smoke family and germa double six of which they're just not you know what i mean so just from the perspective of the government when you're issuing a bounty you're saying that this crew is allied with this kingdom when they're clearly not then it would make sense just for them to go back to just calling him sanji you know what i mean so anyway his bounty is 1 billion 32 million which um, I actually did find out the reason behind Sanji and Zoro's bounties. I'm hitting myself for not realizing this sooner. I was thinking too much into it. A lot of people were. People were looking at Zoro's bounty and they were like, maybe it's binary code. It's just like, it's, you know, their bounties are their birthdays. That's it. I don't know how the government knows their birthdays, but it's just kind of a gag. It wasn't meant to be taken, like, super seriously. So Sanji's birthday is March 2nd, so his bounty is 1 billion 32 million, as in 3 and 2, March 2nd. Zoro's birthday, I already knew this because it was actually relevant for the fact of him being related to the Shimosukis distantly. Shimosuki means frost moon, and November is the month that has the frost moon, and so... To make sense out of this, Zoro's birthday has been November 11th. Okay, so 1 billion, 100 million, 1,100. 11, 11. Hey everybody, editing teching here. I was just uh, editing this video, and as I was, uh, the new chapter of One Piece was officially released on Viz Media. So I was reading that, and it turns out that Zoro's actual bounty was not 1 billion 100 million 1100 like that weird number at the very end uh, it turns out it was actually 1 billion 111 million as in it was four ones followed by the zeros and stuff so that actually makes a lot more sense just in terms of the Marines giving him as a bounty that wasn't like a weird number. Um, in this video, I do mention that Zoro and Sanji's bounties are both based on their birthdays, and it doesn't really matter. So Zoro was born on uh, November 11th, so it really doesn't matter if it was like the ones all together or if the 11 was at the end. Uh, it was just a mistake, but uh, I do mention it a lot throughout the rest of this video, so just go along with it, I guess. I just wanted to bring it up. 
still, if the if the government does not know their their birthdays, it is still kind of funny for the government to be sitting around trying to decide what the right number for Zoro's bounty is. And it's like, all right, one billion, one hundred million. No, nah, that's too low. Uh, one billion, two million. No, it's too high. One billion, one hundred million, one thousand. No, nah, that's still just a hair too low. One billion, one hundred million, one thousand, one hundred. Okay, you might be on to something there, Dave. You know what I mean? Like, it is just kind of funny them sitting around and thinking of this. Uh, or maybe they did know his birthday and they just wanted to like, yeah, let's have a little bit of a flair here. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's how it would go. So it's just their birthdays. There's really nothing else, you know, important beyond that, okay? Uh, but that was the reason, okay? Um, some people brought up they were upset that Sanji and Zoro's bounties are both lower than King and Queen's bounties, who they've defeated at uh, Onigashima. Keep in mind, remember, bounties are not a strict power scaling device in One Piece. It's not like power levels in uh, Dragon Ball Z or whatever, and even those kind of fell off after a while. Um, there's a lot of different factors that go into bounties that aren't just reflective of sheer physical strength. Um, you know what I mean? Like, in the case with Chopper, for example, you know, Chopper has way more physical strength than his bounty is reflecting. Uh, like I said, I think Usopp's might be a little bit too high if we're going purely by physical strength. So there's other factors that are involved here. Um, it's not as simple as just like, okay, you know, King had a bounty of like 1 billion, 300 million or something. Zoro defeated him. So therefore, Zoro's bounty should also be like 1 billion, 400 million. Has to be higher than King because because Zoro defeated King. Um, sometimes that does happen in the story. Sometimes it does occur like that. Um, but not always. Like, look at what happened when Luffy defeated Crocodile. So Crocodile had a frozen bounty of 81 million, but that was inactive for a number of years. Uh, you know, Crocodile's bounty honestly should have been probably at least in like 200 million or something around that ballpark when he was running Baroque Works as Mr. Zero. Uh, it should have been a lot higher than 81, if nothing else. It should have been higher probably than 100. Luffy defeated him, and his bounty was only 100 afterwards. Um, you know what I mean? I'm trying to think of some other example here, like a good example of this. Um, you know, uh, Luffy did defeat Doflamingo at Dressrosa, but that's also not a great example because Doflamingo's bounty was also frozen around 300, and then Luffy's bounty shot up to 500 afterwards. You could argue if the government gave Doflamingo an active bounty and he wasn't a warlord, his bounty would have been over 500, uh, possibly, considering him being... But, you know, there's other factors there because, yes, Doflamingo was strong, but he also headed up the entire underworld. And he also had... He was Joker, he was the broker to Kaido, and he was a former Celestial Dragon. So, actually, that's another question. We did that with Doflamingo. I mean, we did that with Crocodile in the last video. Um, if Doflamingo ever broke out of Impel Down and he was going rogue... What bounty would the government give him that would be fair considering his position and his status and the stuff that he knows? Doflamingo's bounty, I think, should be easily over a billion considering, you know, he's an ex-celestial dragon and everything like that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, that's the reason. Um, I'm just happy Sanji and Zoro both have a bounty of over one billion, okay? Um, I mean, of course, if they were higher, I would have been happier with that, but I'm not too upset that their bounties are what they are. You know what I mean? Uh, it's It kind of resets the status quo. Zoro's bounty is higher than Sanji's. And then we have Jinbei. Didn't forget about you, Jinbei. Right in the middle with a bounty of 1 billion, 100 million straight up. Uh, that doesn't reflect his birthday or anything, although some people did mention that it's actually Ace's bounty of 550 doubled. And Ace does have a connection with Jinbei, so I don't know if that was intentional on Oda's part. If Oda's like, I'm going to take Ace's bounty and double it, and now that's Jinbei's new bounty, I don't know if that was the reason. But there is a parallel there, in case you were curious. Um, and uh, once again, Jinbei being an ex-Warlord of the Sea, and used to be on Fisher Tiger's crew and everything like that, and, um, you know, Master of Fishman Karate and everything, obviously having a 1 billion, 100 million bounty makes sense to me. Also the fact that... You know, he's now in that place where Sanji used to be, where now if you're just going strictly by bounty numbers, it's Luffy, Zoro, and now Jinbei, Sanji being knocked down to number four, okay? Honestly speaking, I think an argument could even have been made for making Jinbei, um, you know, the second highest bounty on the ship. So it goes Luffy, Jinbei, then Zoro, and Sanji. I think that argument could have been made. Um, but it's also important to think that Jinbei is a new recruit, you know, so the world government might be like, okay, Jinbei is certainly very powerful, but he just joined the crew. So to think of him as like the first mate or something, you know, Zoro is also very dangerous in his own right. So we're going to keep Zoro at a higher bounty than Jinbei. 
there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. There are the new bounties. Um, you know, if there's any more, like, ideas on, like, okay, this person deserves a lot more, or I think that Sanji should have been higher, or I think, you know, uh, Jinbei should have been the second highest right after Luffy. You know, Jinbei is a much more seasoned warrior, has a lot more experience. It should have been, like, Luffy 3 billion, Jinbei 2 billion, and Zoro 1 billion or something. Uh, let me know down below and all that good stuff. Thanks for watching. And now... We're getting into uh, the new animal fact. That's right. Lemmings. Go to the intro. That I still don't have. Lemming, lemming, lemming. Let's talk about lemmings. Okay. So probably the most common misconception and folk tale or whatever. Let me tell you a folk tale. Like, let me strum the banjo, you know. Lemmings jump off cliffs and commit a TPK. They commit a total party kill on themselves, okay? And the idea is they just do this because they're stupid. Like, that literally has been the idea that it's kind of circulated around in pop and pop culture. I remember uh, there was an old sketch on Robot Chicken that made fun of this, and they, you know, like, basically just said that Lemmings were actually... <laughs> I, if, the, if I'm remembering the robot chicken sketch correctly, they used uh, the, the not a great word for mentally challenged, but that was the way that they did it. Um, and so this has just been something beyond robot chicken that has permeated the culture. Like lemmings are really stupid and they jump off cliffs and then they, they die. OK, that's the idea. So is this true or not? Yes and no. This behavior has been shown to exist but not because they're stupid, all right? So the reason for this, when it does occur, is that when a lemming population gets large enough, um, their migratory instincts kind of kick in, like, okay, there's too many of us in one location, and there might not be enough food and, you know, areas to, like, live in for all of us, so we're going to branch off and we're going to migrate, find a different home. Well, in a lot of cases, perhaps they might go into the water and they might misjudge the distance. So, for example, they jump off a cliff. They don't die, but they fall in a waterway or a bay or a river or even the ocean. And they might be like, OK, we will now swim because our migration instincts are kicking in and we're going to find a new place to live. However, they don't know if what they're jumping into is a river or a lake or an ocean. So when they, they're trying to swim across the whole damn ocean, they end up dying in the water. So that has been shown to happen, not with every species of lemming, and it's something that just doesn't occur. Like, ah, oh, yes, this is the natural migration of the lemming, where they all jump off into the ocean and die because they all drowned, you know? This is not a common thing. It does not occur, like, every year or whatever, but it has been known to happen in certain populations of lemmings. Now, that might be the imp impetus for why this rumor began, but then it kind of got blown out of proportion. This originally showed up in 1877 in like a, uh, a biological journal or whatever back then. There was some dude that was like, you know, witnessing the, 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 um, the behavior of lemmings. And of course, if a human sees lemmings jumping off cliffs, they're just going to assume like, oh, that's, wow, this animal is so stupid. They just jump off cliffs. I witnessed it happen once. Therefore, it must always happen, you know? So that was where the rumor really began, 1877. But the, the thing that really pounded it into the subculture was um, in 1958. Walt Disney Productions did a little movie called White Wilderness, which was a nature documentary. And it purportedly took place around the Arctic Circle and like the Arctic Ocean, but it was actually filmed a lot in a studio in Alberta, Canada, in like the area around Alberta, Canada. So, you know, it was like, oh, we're going to do this nature documentary, but a lot of it is going to be fabricated and shot in studio, and we're just going to say that it wasn't. You know, it's like, oh, yes. I, I believe there was one scene of a polar bear, like, sliding down, like, a slide, and they made it look like it was happening in the wild, but it was actually happening in a studio. So typical stuff that, like, you know, movie magic. Okay, well, something that certainly wasn't magical was that um, there were a bunch of lemmings that jumped off a cliff in this nature documentary, and that's where it really rose to prominence as this rumor and this uh, pop culture thing where you have this video footage of a bunch of lemmings jumping off a cliff. So what actually probably happened here, because a biologist looked at this footage and he's like, okay, first of all, the species of lemming that are supposed to live around the Arctic Circle, because that's what they said. They said, oh, these lemmings jumped, witness the wonderful lemming, so stupid and ignorant, it jumps off of a cliff into the Arctic Ocean. So it's like, first of all, this wasn't even shot by the Arctic Ocean, and this species of lemming does not 
do this. So what they probably did was they probably took a bunch of lemmings, grabbed them, you know, shipped them off to wherever they were filming this nature documentary, disorientated them, and then kind of just chased them off the cliff. You know, the cameramen were just kind of like, go, lemmings, go, we need to get a good shot. You know what I mean? That's most likely what probably happened, and it kind of lines up with like, oh yeah, nature documentaries back in the 1950s were kind of full of shit, and actually a lot of animal cruelty. Go figure! So, um, yeah, that's where it began. So it's not completely untrue. It does happen, but it's because of their migration habits, not because they're so stupid that they're just like, hey, look, guys, a cliff! Ah! You know, like, and everyone's like, hey, Bill fell off a cliff, let's follow him suit! You know, that's not the reason. Very rarely it does occur but it went out of control because of this movie. And if you think that that's the only misconception about lemmings, oh boy, are you wrong. Stay tuned for Lemming Facts. This will be Teching, signing out.